Welcome to the Dev Ready Podcast, where we're helping non-techs build better tech. Today we have Daryl Carr joining us. Daryl is an experienced architect. He's been in technology for over 30 years now. Um, he's a professional builder, judge on many different awards as well. So Daryl, thanks for joining us. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Now, Daryl, I'd like everyone to introduce themselves, tell us a bit about your history. So take us a bit on a journey of Daryl's experience and uh, some of the things you're involved with. All right, so it's a bit of a long journey, uh, as you can probably tell from the white beard, but uh, it goes back to the late 80s, uh, becoming a programmer uh, and uh, sort of working my up through the, the usual sort of IT ranks, so into sort of designing and, and managing teams and uh, and a little bit of work as a consultant every now and then and um, and through the architecture ranks, uh, solution architecture work, uh, and then uh, eventually into the enterprise architecture space. So. These days, more sort of helping organisations understand what direction to go, what technologies to choose, uh, how their organisation needs to change to meet uh, known and unknown challenges. So uh, to tend, tend to do a bit of work in that space. Uh, also, um, get heavily involved in uh, uh, running of events. So I've been helping to build a sort of a better architecture community, global community over the, the last few years. Uh, I uh, act as an editor for the uh, Enterprise Architecture Professional Journal. I, uh, I chair events. I sit on a lot of advisory boards and committees for the various events around the world. Uh, and uh, in my spare time when I get it, uh, I like to help out with uh, things like uh, judging uh, uh, local and, and national awards like the I Awards and the Insight Awards here in, in Perth in Western Australia. Um, uh, yeah, that's uh, that's basically me. Uh, it's sort of very busy uh, doing everything I can to help uh, uh, both sort of improve the architecture discipline and, and, and help architects and companies on their journey. Perfect, Daryl. So one thing that people might be asking themselves, especially if they're um, in the middle of developing product, they always look at software developers and what does that mean? And they look to engage them. Tell us a bit about the architecture industry, what that means um, to people that are listening in and what that can mean to your product as you develop it moving forward. Yeah, that's a good point. So architects, uh, they tend to be uh, sort of overlooked in, in some circumstances. And, uh, and I think that uh, during the sort of uh, increased awareness of the agile movement, we've seen architects sort of wondering where they fit into the into the puzzle. Uh, one of the things with architecture is that there are multiple disciplines uh, that uh, that sort of come under that umbrella. So I've talked about how I was a solution architect and an enterprise architect, and they're very different roles. One's more the enterprise architect is more sort of strategic focused. Solution architects tend to work on projects. Uh, but then there's uh, security architects, technology architects, so the ones that sort of concentrate more on uh, infrastructure, uh, application architects. So there's a there's a broad umbrella of, of architects that you could be employing for different reasons. Uh, and uh, I guess the sort of solution architect is the one that sort of tries to balance all of those disciplines and, and bring them together into something that's, that's useful. But one of the challenges with an architect, of course, is that um, they don't get to design interfaces. They don't do the sort of, you know, I'm a big fan of human-centered design, so talk to people about design thinking and how to embrace that and, and get feedback loops for the customers going. The architect tends not to get involved in those. They end up sort of more concentrating on the things that make it usable, that uh, that make it uh, perform better, uh, that uh, meet uh, you know, legislative requirements, those sorts of things. So they're in the background uh, making sure that it's a good experience, uh, but uh, don't necessarily get involved in that sort of upfront uh, engagement uh, uh, with customers. So architects for me are the ones that you want to go to to make sure that when you're building something, it's built well, it'll perform well, it'll scale well, um, and uh, and they can help guide your, your people in how to build this solution the best way possible. Yeah, so they deliver on the, the outcomes that you're after. That's not right. Not just the yeah. shiny, flashy experience that looks good. That's good, and that's important as well. You have to be engaging in what you're putting out to market. But uh, uh, if uh, if your app takes um, a, a minute to load uh, and keeps crashing because uh, the the, uh, the load being placed on it by users is more than the infrastructure can handle, you'll soon find yourself without any users. 
Yeah, that's things that people need to think about um, that maybe aren't considering, especially when they're getting in that early stage ideation component. But think about, oh, let's build an app or solution to this problem. Um, people are not generally thinking about scale. They're just looking at something functional. Um, and that's, that's something that, yeah, from your, your experience, what's some of the challenges if they just look at function rather than uh, the holistic approach to making sure this thing is going to scale with the business or to a point? And sometimes you might build something where it only scales to X point um, and there might be a reason for that. So it might be an MVP, for example, and you might say, okay, this may be able to handle to this point, but beyond that, uh, we might have to re-engineer this thing. So from an architect's perspective, getting them involved, what does that mean and when should they get involved? Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Uh, the, uh, my, my personal view is uh, involve your architects as early as possible. So if they can be as a part of the conversation with the, uh, if it's a business analyst or whether it's a UX designer, be involved in those conversations early. Understand what the problem is. Um, if you're getting everything secondhand, you're more likely to be misinterpreting the intent. So if they can be involved up front, that's great. Uh, one thing I would tend to say to people who want to build something new is uh, don't launch straight into the technology. Figure out how you're going to actually uh, offer something to market, get some customer feedback loops going, uh, do some paper-based uh, interactions with them, um, uh, have, a, have a workshop, play around with some post-it notes. Don't just go off and uh, spend uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars on building something just to validate that it works. So, so that's important as well. But once you get beyond that point, you think you've got something that you want to build and you're looking for some from some skilled resources to be able to help build it, then uh, yeah, think about the fact that there are two halves to your requirements for store, your backlog, if you like. One is the functional requirement and the other one is the non-functional. And, and I think the non-functional doesn't get a lot of uh, airtime these days. Um, it's not as sexy. Um, uh, there's a different sort of group of people you need to engage with uh, but as I say, down the track, uh, uh, the shortcuts that you take now are the ones that are going to stop you being able to scale later. So uh, that's important to think about. Um, what I find personally is that there are not a lot of people out there that have the, the skills to elicit those non-functional requirements, to bring those out into the open and, and uh, discover the things that you need to consider when you start designing how the solution might hang together. On the non-functional requirements, people might not get what that actually means. Can you explain that in a bit more detail and give some examples of what that could mean to some people jumping into a development project? Yeah, so there's uh, there's uh, a list of illities that uh, tend to be talked about here, uh, accessibility and, and things like that. Uh, they're the things that talk about how the solution functions that aren't the interface that you're interacting with. So how do people... Uh, get access to it. So what sort of security are you going to be using? Um, how many users will you expect uh, on the platform at any given time? So that might be an app or a website or, or whatever. Uh, are there uh, seasonal peaks that you're expecting? I worked in an organisation once that had a website that would be regularly brought down because at tax time, everybody wanted to get on and get their tax tax. And <laughs> I wonder so which department it was. <laughs> it, would, uh, it would then crash. Uh, so that's uh, that's important. So um, there's, there's a number of these sorts of uh, uh, considerations that need to be fleshed out. The, the classic ones, of course, are do you want it to operate 24-7? Is, um, is that every day of the year? Is it... Uh, is it uh, going to be uh, 10 concurrent users or a million? Um, those sorts of things. So, uh, they're, they're important, uh, as is security and things like, uh, are there any legislative obligations? Do you have to worry about um, uh, the SPAM Act, for instance, in terms of your communication with your customers when they sign up and you start sending them information? There are uh, a myriad of, of considerations that, that need to be taken into account once you're attempting to scale and you're, you're putting a solution out there. I think that conversation there covers scalability and what that means. Um, this, an arch architecting a platform really is understanding the scale. If it's going to be hundreds of millions of users, uh, we might not know that at the beginning. So you, you generally, in reality, you can't always build an infrastructure and a platform to scale for 
the, that big application to begin with, you might start in increments. How do you talk to, I know you mentioned this before, you advise a little bit on the, um, the startup world or that new idea world. How do you advise them to approach this end of the, the equation when you may not have that, that big scale of numbers now? What should they put into place to allow them to, to move forward and scale their product out? I, uh, as I said before, the uh, the idea of getting uh, uh, some ideas off the ground without building things is a good idea. Uh, if it's more sort of inclined to, to require an actual interface, some sort of functional sort of prototype, if you like, there are plenty of options available to, to do rapid prototyping. There's uh, plenty of um, uh, platforms out there that you can look at that uh, enable you to build things uh, quicker, uh, without, uh, needing to employ, you know, a number of technical resources, which can be difficult to, to find the funding for before you've got some sort of proven, uh, product uh, out there, or at least a demonstration. Uh, the solutions like, uh, our systems, uh, which is a low code development platform. You can very quickly prototype ideas. Uh, it's a, a novice and a non-technical person can use that platform. Uh, you can put something out on their cloud uh, and have a hundred users use it. So that's a great um, uh, tool, I guess, for uh, for validation with customers. Get some feedback going, refine the model, and then you've got a prototype that you can put in front of potential investors and say, "Well, this is this is what we found. This is the work that we did. This is the actual customer feedback that we had and how we improved it." Uh, and you can show traction. So those those sorts of options are, are there. I'd also recommend that you find a good, uh, trustworthy uh, technical advisor, somebody who can come in and advise your team on what the sort of things are that you'll eventually need to think about that uh, you might need to start considering now so that you're setting yourself up for success and not finding yourself with a whole bundle of, of, of dead ends of brick walls to run into uh, as you go about the process. I think that's some really good advice there because we can always jump in and start building. That's probably one of the biggest mistakes that most um, people make when building any tech product. They can just jump in um, and start developing. And with the worlds of, um, in the world of agile, people just like to jump in and build things, um, which is all well and good. But yeah, having something written on paper is a, is a good starting point. Um, and yeah, some sort of um, low, Low fidelity, low fidelity sort of prototyping is, is a really good way to look at it and just test your outcomes because Generally, the reason why projects go wrong is they're one not clear on what they're what the experience should look like. They're not clear on what the problem really is. Um, they might not be clear on the user's expectations, um, and they might not be clear how to deliver this thing. So, clarity is one of the key things across anything. And the more you can test and evolve your concept before getting into development and getting clear on the key outcomes, objectives, what the users really need, the better chances you have of succeeding. And you may choose not to develop this thing too. That's that's an outcome um, that yeah many people can get to, and I think that's a good outcome rather. Than spending that 100, 200, 300 million dollars on developing product that no one wants to use. That's right. And of course, as I say, there's lots of platforms out there. There are companies building platforms specifically for this purpose, and you can leverage their development budget. You don't have to spend that yourself. Uh, yeah. So that's that's always good to remember. And as a startup, you're having that uh, limited budget, whether you're putting your own money or you're looking for investment, it's really important to have that prototype and that idea evaluated before you go through the proper development and go through the and spend all your money on something that not might necessarily not work it's not guaranteed yeah. that your idea is going to hit the right target or be the right product and if it is the right product not necessarily mess sell the message out right so you're not necessarily just testing the idea it's also testing the messaging to get your users that's right yeah it's uh, as i say I'm a big fan of sort of um, you know design thinking approaches and uh and getting that uh, that feedback loop going, uh, yeah, that's no, it's very important. When when we look at um, designing a product, you mentioned one or two things there. You mentioned get a technical advisor um, team. If you're looking for a tech team, what are some of the things that you want to be thinking about? Um, from yeah, your architect, what who should you be talking to? How you might be approaching those conversations if you're basically out there hunting for a tech team. What's some advice you can give some people here? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. Uh, what I'm seeing at the moment, uh, having sort of 
uh, had these conversations for the last few years is that uh, there are uh, people out there uh, uh, setting up platforms that support, uh, I guess, these types of conversations by um, offering the, the uh, ability to find and validate the skills of, of technical uh, uh, people. Uh, so you've got uh, organisations, there's one called Endorse, there's another one called Doc, and, and what they're doing is trying to set up uh, a way of independently verifying people's ability and skill. Uh, they're focused more on the sort of hard technical skills at the moment, so things like uh, development uh, capabilities, uh, but I expect that that'll increase over time and you'll, you'll be able to see uh, other people being able to have their, their capabilities independently verified uh, on these platforms. So there's those that are evolving. Uh, of course, there's always the sort of traditional sort of networking uh, types of things. So get out there and, and meet people and, uh, and learn new things from them and start to establish an understanding of, of who you feel you can trust. Uh, or who they might be able to introduce to you uh, that, uh, that that they trust. Uh, uh, so that's that's the main sort of approach at this point. Uh, but it's it's interesting to see these new platforms being developed, and uh, uh, a number of them, Endorse and Doc in particular, are based on uh, blockchain, and uh, they're using that sort of trustless uh, concept that's inherent in, in blockchain technologies to be able to um, have a an independent uh, consensus-based verification of skills. So it'll be interesting mm -hmm. to see how that evolves over time. And generally, if there's a solution, there's a problem, <laughs> generally. Um, yeah, this space is, there's a lot of people that sort of get stuck in, in the wrong little rabbit hole um, and end up spending a lot of money uh, just working with wrong teams, wrong people um, that aren't capable of really delivering what they're looking for. But it's, it's a tough space it's a tough game technology it all it all is dependent on the person being able to communicate communication is really key um, if you've got key stakeholders if they're the people on the tech side cannot draw out the requirements and the features and the functions and the needs of the users that's a big issue um, so i think it's all heavy on the communication side because generally the consumer or the, the person looking to build the product isn't not capable or may not be technical enough to understand what they don't know um, and that's where the, the advisor or the the team needs to be able to draw that out and collaborative work, work together um, i see building tech is more a collaborative process between all key stakeholders not just um the developer and the person who has the idea it's everyone and anyone in between and i think the more you open up the conversation um between everybody the better outcome you're generally going to have. Um, how have you found that in your world and the, how do you find opening up those silos, especially if you're in the, in the corporate space and sort of outcomes you might find by doing that? Yeah, that's a, a really good point. Um, look, um, in my experience, uh, our ability to misinterpret each other uh, seems to have no limits. Mm. So uh, <laughs> it does, it doesn't. <laughs> I think you mentioned the word clarity uh, earlier, yes. and, and that's really mm. key, I think. Uh, and it takes practice. Uh, mm -hmm. and uh, you should expect to continue to make mistakes in that regard. You'll get mm -hmm. feedback that you weren't expecting, but the important thing is to establish a mechanism by which you get that feedback. Uh, so uh, communication is obviously important. Um, forms of communication can, can differ depending on what you're trying to do, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, definitely sort of concentrate on um, uh the sort of breadth of understanding that you require. So one of the things that I've found difficult in the in the architecture space is stakeholder identification. So being able to actually draw up a list of who you should be talking to, who's impacted by something, uh, and then uh, figuring out how to work with those people to elicit what they need out of it and understanding that the problem is probably more complex than you think. Uh, and so oversimplification can be a real issue. Uh, but... Uh, and your stakeholder group is probably larger than you think. Uh, but uh, try to focus in on, on uh, some key relationships, prioritise them, and be um, uh, open and, and honest in your communication and, and build those feedback loops so that, uh, so that you're getting positive feedback and then being willing to understand the feedback and, and action it regardless of whether it was aligned to your original intent. It's that idea of, uh, I think, in the startup space, they talk about... Uh, 
uh, uh, killing your children, which is a terrible, terrible <laughs> phrase, but being willing to accept that this baby that you were sort of bringing into existence isn't the right one. It's it's the wrong direction. There's no there's no interest in it. It was just in your head. So give it, move to something that you can validate in the real world and uh, and work towards that. Uh, that. That can be challenging for a lot of people, but. Uh, that will certainly save you money in the long run. Yeah, even just with that stake- stakeholder identification, that doesn't mean trying to interview every single user who's going to use your platform. And a lot of the time, it's like you said, it's difficult to find them all because most people assume that, yep, I've got the idea, I know how it should work. Or if it's like in a business setting, it's I'm a manager, I know what I'm doing. It's the people underneath have to do it this way. But it's not dealing with the people who are actually impacted by the system are going to use it. And it's all right, trying to identify them by their role or the usage, not by how many of them do we have or how many users are we trying to target and let's get all of them involved. That really Sorry. makes a difference to try and get their opinion so you can pivot in the right way. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Sorry, you, you uh, broke up for a bit there, so <laughs> I might have missed a bit of the question, but uh, that's okay. I get the idea. Yeah, absolutely. Being willing to change and, uh, and um, uh, understand the direction that is, is playing out in front of you as opposed to sort of relentlessly trying to keep back on the original path that you thought you wanted to tread, that's, uh, I think that's a, a key thing for, for a lot of people to learn. I think um, one of the, the key realisations of being in business, I've been in business for 12, 13 years now, uh, developing different products, we own our own SaaS product as well, is the thing that you just said there, be willing to kill your, kill your children or your babies. Um, because we can get a bit own, we can become too protective of our ideas, and I think that's that can limit your exposure. Because in reality, you should have one objective, and that's create value um, in business or however you're looking at it. Solve problems, create some value, and your solution may yes add some value, but maybe it's not the right way to approach it. Maybe you found a problem that is realistic, but not everyone wants it done in that way. Maybe it needs to be looked at this way. Or your problem is only the, the tip of the iceberg and the real problem is underneath if you're willing to explore um, and impact and create more value by just listening and getting feedback. On that note too, your users don't always know what they don't know too. So sometimes you need to take a bit of a gut feel into some situations and know that um, you can create value beyond what a user perceives as value too. So it's a bit of a, a, a rocky road there between am I right or should I follow users? It's a tough one. It's also yeah, trying especially... to find, say, a problem worth solving. It might not be worth solving. Yeah, definitely. Um, we're on a podcast a little while back and um, someone was talking about, uh, it's Philip Knoll, I think it was, he yeah. was talking about the the, um, the toothpaste. Um, if you interviewed 100 people, you would find that um, 98% would say, yes, I can't get all the toothpaste out of a tube. Um, and that's most people's reality. But is that a problem worth solving? You asked 100 again, probably none of them would say, yeah, I'll pay money to solve that problem. It's not a very not a big enough problem. So yeah, we do need to find a real problem that people um, do see as, um, if it's solved, it will add significant value to them. And then in, in the end, it needs to be a, a business that can generate um, money, revenue and profit so you can continue to serve your users better as well. Yeah, that's right. And, and of course, there's always the uh, the odd circumstance where uh, something entirely new is being created. It goes back to the old sort of Henry Ford comment about if I'd asked mm-hmm. them what they wanted, they would have said faster. Faster horse. Mm-hmm. Uh, so every now and then there will be something that, uh, that comes up that is completely novel that you will want to sort of uh, pursue because you see the value in it, particularly if you have the backing already. But I feel like that's a very small number. Uh, mm-hmm. Most of it is uh, an improvement and uh, mm-hmm. is better supported by the ability to change direction uh, when needed. And in that scenario, your problem becomes more of an education and awareness rather than trying to sell your product. You need to tell people what the problem is if it's a new mm-hmm. thing that they haven't sort of framed in their mind before. Yeah, and it's interesting that uh, sort of people sort of ask, uh, well, how, how do you come up with an idea of, of uh, what to build, uh, what type of solution you want. And, and yet the same person might then tell you about all of these issues that they're having in terms of being able to manage something in their life. Well, there's a problem that you can go and solve. And uh, potentially, if that's the sort of problem that a lot of people face, then you've got a market. 
Uh, so uh, you know, just think about those things that are challenging to you in your life. Uh, have a look at uh, conversations you're having with other people, see some similarities, and um, and if it's something you're passionate about, then head off and build it. Yeah, that's generally where my ideas come from, something I've experienced. <laughs> Now, Daryl, you, you mentioned at the, the top of the, the conversation when you introduced yourself, your work on judging on a couple of awards. Now, I wanted to just dig in a little bit here. Uh, I think I asked this conversation off air um, around what makes a, a good pitch, a good team? What have you found are the standouts within, um, and a, from a judging perspective on ideas, on solutions, what do you find is really the standout part of those conversations for you? Yes, yeah, so I've been uh, fortunate enough to be involved in judging of uh, both the Inside Awards here in WA and, and also the I Awards nationally. And uh, and uh, uh, just out of, uh, I think, coincidence, I, I found myself in the sort of the community services sector uh, judging those awards. So I get to see uh, people with passion that are trying to solve real problems in the world. Uh, and so if, if anybody ever wants to... Uh, if they find themselves with a you know a little bit sort of uh, jaded and depressed about their, their technology career, go and volunteer for one of these awards. You are constantly exposed to fantastic people who are dedicating their lives to fixing problems for people. Um, so it's a, it's a great uh, antidepressant for your career if, uh, if you're in that sort of thing. If you're if you're in that position, just walk away from your career, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so Hope you get perhaps, some joy out of it. <laughs> perhaps maybe it wasn't yeah. for you in the first place. But, um, yeah. uh, but certainly uh, the things that I sort of look for when I'm judging uh, now it it can be a bit uh, sort of difficult. Uh, uh, in that you're, you're thinking that you're, you're looking for people that are p particularly charismatic and that mm -hmm. uh, that are really good at selling something. But often in these award processes, there is a structure to them. There is a set of criteria that you need to address. So what we look for is people that are able to clearly articulate how they address the criteria in the awards. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's an important thing. If you're going to be submitting for these awards, pay attention to the criteria because that's what the judges are looking for. Um, and we tend to run processes where there's uh, online submissions so that get reviewed uh, and then shortlisted for, for instance, in the RI Awards and the National Final, uh, which had to pivot to a virtual event last year, but uh, previously it was an in-person presentation. So lots of people flying in. We usually ran it in, in Melbourne. Uh, people flying in from all over the country to do basically a 20-minute pitch to the, to the judges. And that puts a lot of pressure on them. So obviously a lot of preparation is really important, understanding how you're going to address the main concerns of what that, that pitch is about, uh, doing the re rehearsals to make sure it's timed uh, properly um, and, uh, and and show that passion again. As I say, it's, it's important to see that you're not going through the motions here, you're actually passionate about the solution. You're not... The award's important, but what you really want to sort of convey is how passionate you are about the problem that you're solving. Uh, and, and that certainly comes across. We can see that uh, with the people that stand in front of us as, as a judging panel and, uh, and talk to about, uh, us about how they're, they're, they're changing the world for the better, which is, uh, which is an awesome opportunity for, for people like me to be able to be part of. You mentioned passion about seven or eight times in that uh, last minute conversation. So I think um, in anything in life, in work, in, it, we need a passion. And if you're going to jump all in on um, if it's a, an idea, even if it's in a business, whatever it might be, you need to be 100% committed and passionate that it's going to deliver outcomes and, and create some impact um, within your environment or just whatever, even in your, in your world, basically. Um, and if it's a big audacious goal that's great if it's just something that's going to solve problem for 100 200 people that's a great thing too uh, you're still adding value but you still need to be passionate to deliver it and see it through because uh, in the world of technology you will have challenges you will um, come across some um, some particular things that that may set you back um, and hopefully there's not too many of those because it has um, killed some projects along the journey just by not being in a position of thinking about everything. So yeah, just passion is important in all frames of world uh, and in frames of everything you're doing. So I think that's um, pivotal to what you just said there. Yeah, I, I sort of uh, remind people that uh, on the journey that you go on, there will be obstacles. They, yes. uh, they will um, sort of, things will come up that will be challenging for you. And the thing that allows you to get over those hurdles 
is the passion, the drive that you have for what you're doing. So if there's sufficient, um, you know, a momentum through what you're trying to achieve and, and you really believe in it, then then uh, the obstacles are easier to get over. They, they will be hard. Uh, there'll be technical challenges. There'll be people challenges. There'll be financial challenges. Uh, but if you're dedicating your life to fixing that problem, if you have a real passion about it, sorry to use that word again, but if you have a real passion about it, then it'll help you to drive past those obstacles. Perfect, Daryl. If um, we started this conversation just exploring what architecture means, um, if along your journey, what would you advise people on three tips, um, or maybe in one or two, when they're talking to an architect or some people that are in a, in a, in a world where they're going to help them develop or flesh out a product? What are three things you want to know before you jump into uh, working with somebody in this space? I'll tell you the two questions that I get asked a lot. Um, okay. Who are you and what are you doing? Here? <laughs> um, that's, uh, that's not a good place to start. No. But, um, look, and you're asking in terms of uh, mm. somebody's talking to an architect? And, and yeah, so understand. just looking for some people. So what should I be asking? What's some of the things I need to know when I'm jumping into some of these conversations? So if you're a startup getting out and looking for someone to develop your idea and get the ball rolling. Well, yeah, I've talked to a number of uh, teams about the idea that, uh, and I'm sure you've heard it yourself, uh, about the, uh, the the pitch deck for, for a startup and how there tends to be a lot of focus on, on a couple of areas. One is the team. So who are the people that you've got involved and uh, what are their backgrounds and, and how can they sort of... Um, uh, show that they are adding value to the to the effort that you're undertaking, uh, and that's that's really important. The other thing, just as an aside, is uh, is that you've got some validation, you've got some data that backs up what you're trying to do, whether it's determination of what the market might look like, um, or validation from your customers, that sort of thing. So make sure that that's covered off. But when you're talking about your team, you you want to be presenting a team that shows evidence that they know what they're doing. Uh, that they're passionate about it, but also have that experience and the skills required to be balanced across the sort of full gamut of, of what the team needs to be able to drive the idea forward. So, of course, then if you're looking for an architect to be part of that team, then you're looking for somebody who has evidence of the experience that they built uh, over their, the course of their career. So one of the things about the architecture discipline, particularly as you get up into the sort of solution and enterprise architecture levels, uh, but just as much for the others as well, I suppose, is that uh, you have to accrue experience over a period of time. So they tend to be more senior in the uh, sort of uh, IT ranks, uh, and that's because they have to have gone through the process of learning a whole bundle of things that then come together to help inform their, their work as an architect. So you're looking for evidence of that. Uh, you're also looking for somebody who believes in what you're doing and is willing to make all of that extra effort because so many of these things are being done as part-time endeavours outside of people's day jobs. Uh, so uh, are they passionate? So will they commit? And do they have demonstrable experience in the areas that you're interested in? Have they designed applications? Do they really understand infrastructure and security? Um, what do they know about uh, you know the public cloud platforms? Um, can they stand up uh, stand up an environment? If it's a technical role, can they stand up an environment in you know as your AWS or or any other particular cloud platform that you're interested in, in working with? So there's ways of determining their their technical skills, but also their fit for for the for the team that you're building. Oh, perfect, Daryl. Um, in terms of coming on the podcast, thank you for coming on and joining us and talking all things, a bit of architecture and a bit of everything else too, because I think we touched upon um, what it might mean to design an idea. And we talked about not technically jumping into products too early. And that's coming from an architect. So listen, everybody out there, because it's generally one of the biggest tips. Um, it's all about testing the idea. And if you can test it without building anything, that's a much better place to be than going through the journey and building something and then testing it and then finding out nobody's interested. So you do not want to be in that position. So thanks, Daryl, for coming on and sharing your experience and your journey thus far and how people might be able to um, just think about um, technology as a, as a holistic thing because yeah we can get too focused on what it does and not how it is all actually going to come together and scale and actually get out to market and um, serve your users in the best available light so thanks for daryl for coming on and joining us thank Maurice, you. thanks for having us cheers daryl thank you for your time thanks.